Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Nomen live stream. I'm your host, Adam Hartel. Um, and uh, what you were, if you're new to the channel, if you're new to Nomen, what you're just looking at is uh, the result of an education at Nomen. We are a 3D art school located in Hollywood, California. We specialize in training artists for careers and things like animation, visual effects, uh, films, uh, games, television, you name it. Uh, and that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. We are going to be speaking with Nomen's founder and president, Alex Alvarez. Um, but before I introduce him, I'd like to just mention that if you're in need of closed captioning for the stream today, you can head over to our Facebook page and uh, you'll be able to get closed captioning on Facebook Live. Uh, today's stream is also going to be available as video on demand on our YouTube uh, channel as well as our Twitch channel um, if you missed any portion of it. So you can head over there and catch it. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, not that Alex necessarily needs an introduction, but in case any of you are new, um, I'd just like to mention that um, aside from being the founder and president of Nomen, Alex has been involved with CG uh, for quite a long time. Uh, and uh, in the mid-90s, he was in fact working with Alias Wavefront, the creators of Maya, um, and spent a lot of time in tons of studios across Southern California, uh, working with Maya, teaching artists, helping uh, studios get set up in that regard. Um, he's also an accomplished artist and teacher. He's taught thousands of students on our campus, online and around the world, um, and also a industry artist himself, having worked on such projects as Star Trek, Prometheus, Super 8, Avatar, and more. Um, and Alex continues to be very involved uh, in the education uh, at Nomen, in forming Nomen, and continuing to in innovate Nomen. And that's uh, some of what we're going to be talking about today. So. Without any further ado, I'd like to bring Alex on stream. Hello, sir. <laughs> How are you today? Good. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you. Good to um, see you. We mostly see each other uh, remotely these days on computer screens. I know. Um, well, yeah. Canvas will be open again Yeah. on Monday. <clears throat> then that's really good. I'm glad we're bouncing back so quickly uh, in the midst of everything that's going on. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that, you know, a little bit later, that's some, some of what I'd like to talk about with you, um, you know, in the midst of being in such a prolonged pandemic and all of the interruptions that that's created across mm -hmm. industries, in education and so forth, Nomen has still managed to place the vast majority in, mm -hmm. in the high 90th percentile of our students in the industry. Um, and I, I do want to talk about that a little bit later, but before we do, you know, um, I intro to you, but I think uh, for anybody that uh, is new to Nomen, uh, is perhaps new to you, um, could you tell us a little bit, uh, just briefly, about yourself mm -hmm. and um, why why 3D? What, what How did you become such an early adopter of doing art on a computer? Uh, okay. So, uh, well, I got back, in, I got into 3D, I think, in 93. 94 which is a while ago i guess yeah. um but in if you look back what happened in 93 like i was in college and so and uh jurassic park and terminator 2 came out and so those were both films that came out uh, around like 92 93 early 90s <laughs> so prior to that you know computer graphics um, were fairly rudimentary in the 80s um, when i was a teenager but i was super into video games and computer graphics pretty early on because at that time in the 80s not a lot of people were but i had a computer and would play with uh ascii art and you know simple paint programs but it was mostly playing video games you know mm -hmm. um and then when i was in college these like uh videotapes started circulating that had like trippy computer animation on them that was like some of the first animation done on computers and i thought it was the incredibly cool for whatever reason those tapes really spoke to me and then coincidentally around the same time jurassic park came out uh terminator 2 came out and that uh everybody you know globally started talking about the rise of computer graphics because all of a sudden computer graphics went from looking kind of very rudimentary like if you think of tron like the first tron movie, mm -hmm. um to looking photo real um so that's when i decided i wanted to explore and figure <coughs> out what this 3d thing was but the thing to remember is this is before the internet and so the internet really didn't become a thing until the mid 90s so getting information was pretty hard um so i dropped out of college took a year off worked at a comic book company as a colorist they had a video game division 
Um, so I would hang out over there a little bit and they had people doing very rudimentary computer graphics, you know, cause game art in the early nineties, especially anything using 3d, if you think of the PlayStation one, which was like mm -hmm. the first console to have 3d, um, you know, they were cool, but they were still very blocky, very like low poly game art. And, uh, and I wanted to do like the more high res stuff. Uh, so I thought, and then the biggest transformative moment for me was the release of the game mist which yes. came out and kind of blew everybody's mind i mean it sold millions of copies it was the number one selling game of that year at a time of like cd-rom games which had like a lot of live action stuff mixed in with cg and uh and i learned that mist was made uh by two brothers at home on a mac and so that's kind of what made me realize the accessibility of creating visuals that were in things that i liked and so i got a mac and uh, got a program called Infinity, which was a very rudimentary 3D program at the time. Um, and, uh, and that kind of started my journey. Um, but in 93, the year that Jurassic Park came out and the year that Mist came out, if you compare Jurassic Park and Mist, like very different visual fidelity. Yeah. And so Mist was basically what you could do at home on a home computer. Like that was state of the art computer graphics, which was very not photoreal, um, but cool. And Jurassic Park is what you could do on a $100,000 workstation with $100,000 software. So I had to go to school so I could get access to the stuff. And so, yeah, so that sent, sent me on the road of learning uh, Power Animator, which was the software that was the precursor to Maya and, and the rabbit hole that began of my obsession with 3D. And now it's 25 years later and I'm still spending 12 hours a day in front of 3d software making <laughs> yeah. stuff and i mean there's nothing i like doing more than sitting in front of a computer and making stuff in 3d and uh over the years all the tools have changed and evolved and gotten cooler and you know this year the buzzword is unreal and mm -hmm. uh and so i've started found that rabbit hole and learning unreal and the project i'm on now is is 100 percent unreal and it's awesome so so yeah so that's kind of condenser and then obviously no man happened in there <laughs> Of course, yeah. Well, I think that's the interesting thing is um, I I found it, as I spent a lot of my time at Noman in outreach interfacing with people who are interested in coming to Noman. Um, I think that a lot of the students that we get uh, actually parallel your journey in one form or another because Noman's Noman's not necessarily a place that you come to discover yourself, you 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 arrive at Noman because you've been tenaciously looking for a place that you yeah. can learn these things. Yeah. Um, you know, and it just so happened that you needed to found that school. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think at the time you had to go, you know, working for Alias Wavefront was the closest that you could get yeah. to Maya, to learning Maya. Um, yeah. And then the founding of Noman was like, well, now let's let's make this available to more artists. Let's make this available to especially industry artists that need to learn these skills. Yeah. Um, speaking of some of the stuff that you enjoy doing, um, out of curiosity, what have you, what have you, what's been inspirational to you lately? What, what's been captivating your interest and driving your creativity? Lately, it's, it's really, like I mentioned, is, is, is unreal, you know, mm -hmm. and just uh, what's going on in that space as far as real time graphics and the fidelity of real time going up, because that's, if, if you go back again to, you know, the early 90s where like, like enabling, ra like ray tracing wasn't an option. Like even right. if your software in the late 90s had ray tracing, ray tracing is an algorithm to calculate reflections and bounce light in a scene. So in the late 90s, you couldn't even think of enabling ray tracing because it was too expensive. And you're talking about software being unbelievably slow, you know, that mm -hmm. if you're uh, when I got started with 3D, you know, the windows were all wireframe. There was no such thing as working in shaded mode. So you were just spinning around a wireframe. And if you wanted to see it shaded, you had to re hit render and wait a few minutes just to see it shaded. Yeah. These days, everything's real time. So if you think of like, you know, things that, uh, you know, that I can full screen have Unreal running with real time ray tracing and real time reflections and real time global illumination, um, it's insanity. And, uh, and that's really exciting because a lot of the things about becoming an artist is, you know, the amount of time you spend making stuff and looking what you made, evaluating it and figuring out what you could do better, right? It's the, the cycle of iteration and art direction and trying to improve. Mm -hmm. And the slower software is, the longer it takes to get better. 
So it took a long time to get good as an artist or as a 3D artist in the early 90s because the software was so slow. That also explains why if you look at student work from 25 years sure. ago, it was yeah. far more rudimentary. <clears throat> and today the software is so much more interactive you know, as far as the speed of rendering and things that are real time now, it's a lot more fun because you can make stuff so much faster. You can learn so much faster. You can iterate so much faster. Um, so, you know, like uh, for Unreal specifically, like they have Epic Epic Games who make Unreal uh, and Fortnite and a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, they have this thing that they were doing for the last couple of years called Fellowship, where yeah. they would invite some industry artists in and do this crash course on Unreal. Um, because Unreal has kind of taken the film or sort of uh, animation industry by storm in the last year because of the fact that it's now transitioning from being a game engine to now being a game engine as well as an engine you can use to do uh, film and cinematics and final pixel animation. And not a lot of people are using it for that. You know, Mandalorian yeah. was one of the big shows where mm -hmm. all the backgrounds, the environments were shot uh, using Unreal being projected or being displayed on these huge LED walls that actors are in front of. And that kind of piqued a lot of people's interest of like, wait a second, all those backgrounds in the Mandalorian are CG done in real time in mm -hmm. Unreal. Like a lot of people wanted to find out what that meant. So Epic started this fellowship. And uh, luckily the guy who runs it, Brian Poole is a Nomen grad from like 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I, I pinged him and asked if it would be possible <clears throat> for me to do the fellowship. Cause while we have Unreal classes at Nomen and Unreal has been part of Nomen for years, it's more on the game side not on the floor yeah. of final pixel animation side, which is much newer to Unreal and fewer people are doing it. So I enrolled in the fellowship, a five week crash course, which was really, really cool. And then, uh, you know, my, the, the short that I made, I think is in Restream, like we could even show it, but ultimately um, the fact that you can not know how to use Unreal and in a month learn it and make something like that, yeah, wouldn't have been possible 25 years ago with any software because of the fact that the software was so much slower. Just yeah. rendering that animation 25 years ago would have taken days of rendering on a single workstation. Um, you know, one of the first animations I rendered on my home Mac when I was in the 3D was just like the spinning chrome ball moving around the scene. Mm -hmm. I remember I had to leave my computer for like a week at home rendering oh to render like yeah. a spinning chrome ball. Yeah. So yeah, no, Unreal is, is, is awesome. Super stoked on it allowing me and a lot of people to do things that they weren't able to do before from a budgetary perspective because you can yes. render in real time yeah yeah and i it, it sounds i mean would you say that this this shift that's happening like you said of unreal graduating from being so oh well that's something that you work in if you want to do games because it's not ready for film and those kind of things right. yet uh the shift now where it's like no it's it looks beautiful it looks realistic it looks photo real enough now that you can have real-time animation for things yeah. like film because that is similar it's yeah. quite limited like there's a lot of sure. things you can't do in unreal but uh there's certain things so like you're still going to see you know big studios like ilm and weta or pixar or whatever or disney using tools like maya and houdini oh, and, of you know, for yeah. final pixel animation because of the level of complexity they need yes you know um that there is a limit to how much unreal can handle it's changing Mm -hmm. But there's a limit and a lot of the tools for animation and Unreal are still kind of rudimentary because mm -hmm. a lot of this stuff is new, like being able to animate directly in Unreal, like is something that you only all of a sudden can do in the last like year, but it's missing a lot of animation tools that a tool like right. Maya would have. So yes. right now you're seeing people use things together, <clears throat> like you can use Unreal mm -hmm. and Maya together. There's a thing called Live Link so that you can be in Maya animating while seeing oh, it cool. update in Unreal. Okay. Um, or there's uh, things like uh, Alembic, which allows you to like do an effects simulation in Houdini, export that to disk and import that into Unreal. So oh, you, wow. can't, you cannot just use Unreal. Like no matter yeah. what, you have to use auxiliary programs. Um, it's best to look at Unreal as like scene assembly. Okay, yeah. And I've, I've noticed that in some of the art streams that we've seen you working with your project in Unreal. I've, I've watched you go into uh, Maya and block out an entire landscape yeah. and yeah. then take individual assets from that into ZBrush, sculpt some rocks, that exactly. kind of stuff, exactly. and then bring it on under real um, exactly. texture. Whatnot. And you couldn't like you take a, a recent CG character like Godzilla, you were just not at a place where they could animate Godzilla with the complexity and the high poly count. I mean, they still have to cut up a character like that when they're working with the absolute top renderers yeah. um, out there. 
-hmm. But do you think with the evolution of things that are happening in real time, do you think that we are going to witness a similar kind of a leap forward as we saw when, you know, films like Terminator 2 and Jurassic Park dropped? Yeah. I mean, that's happening every year. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it's, every, every year something new happens in CG. And that's what's so exciting about this industry. And that, that's what yeah. I've loved about it since the beginning. You know, I, I think that for, you know, a lot of people that are looking at career paths, you know, something that's fun about life is learning new stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, and there are certain careers where you can get to a point of mastery, you know, um, and things kind of stabilize. Um, but our industry is not that way. You know, yes. like being an artist in general is a constant process of learning, you know, mm -hmm. for life, whether it's anatomy and form and shape language and architecture and whether it's creatures or characters or vehicles or it's just so vast being an artist and all the things you can learn. But mm -hmm. then the tools keep changing. You right. know, the, the tools keep getting better and more exciting, but they keep changing. So you're constantly having to learn because, you know, Unreal just happened or Maya or Houdini just added these tools. There's a new version of ZBrush came out and added all these tools. So you're what you're able to do keeps changing. You keep having to learn. Um, but that's exciting. Like for yes. me, I've never found that to be intimidating. Like I've, I accepted a long time ago that I cannot know everything. That I'm right. always going to be hoop, yeah. super aware of all the things I don't know and may never know. But I see that as exciting. I see that as like, a, you know, you just sort of like have some humility and just accept the fact that we live in a collaborative industry. Yes. It takes hundreds of people to make a movie, uh, whether you're at a future animation studio, whether you're at Blizzard making games. These are all collaborative efforts where you have all these people that have all these different strengths and you're part of that. You can only be so good and know so much. And you're just constantly in the state of just trying to get better, being around cool people, learning from them. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's just the nature of this industry. So it's very dynamic, you yes. know. Um, and yeah, it's one thing that's for sure over the last 25 years is it's never stopped changing, you know. Yeah. And, and, and with projects too, like, you know, the big project of this year that I think people have been the most excited about is Arcane, you know. And if yes. you speak of Arcane, as a visual evolution, you know, Arcane is beautiful. I mean, it's ridiculously beautiful. And uh, that's an evolution, you know, yeah. it's an evolution of look at how things were in the 80s or in the, in the 90s with animation. It was all 2D. Mm -hmm. Then Toy Story came out and Shrek came out. And all of a sudden people were talking about 3D and Disney and DreamWorks started shutting down their 2D switching all the artists over from 2D to 3D. Noman started doing a ton of trading for artists from Disney and DreamWorks to transition mm -hmm. from 2D to 3D. And then everything became 3D with a very specific look, right? So from hand-painted and hand-drawn to 3D. And then you look at Arcane, and it's like this full circle of now it's yes. 3D, and it's 2D, <clears throat> and it's painted, mm -hmm. but it's also rendered to look realistic. It's, it's so exciting, you know? So It really is. There's always, there's always new stuff. Yeah. yeah, and I I love that. I think even when you don't understand the world of CG, you see something like Arcane Drop, and even if you can't look at it and go, well, wow, they're doing that in render, and then they're doing that painting on the model. You just look at it and go, this is something new. This is I've never seen this before. It's amazing. I'm I'm really glad that you brought up the idea of being a lifelong learner, um, and how that keeps keeps you fresh, keeps you inspired keeps you moving forward as an artist, because I think um, well, we're going to be getting into a series of streams where we're literally going to be talking about the artist's journey and we're going to be talking about, um, you know, how to overcome things like creative block and how to stay sustainable and how to, you know, self care as an artist when I know for myself, I can easily spend, you know, 12 hours a day in front of a computer, but that also takes a toll. Mm -hmm. um, I find that there's, I have a lot of conversations with aspiring artists and there's there's kind of this way that I think culture has shaped a mentality of, well, you know, success as an artist means that I'm arriving somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then you see new tools come out and, oh, well, that tool is going to make it easier for me to arrive over here. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's a little self-defeating. But what you're framing is this idea of the fact that I will never arrive is good news. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think that keeps you driven, keeps you developing. Yeah. Uh, and would you, I mean, it seems that the success of an artist is more tied to their willingness to keep evolving yeah. as opposed to now I know how to push a button and make money. I mean, there's milestones for everyone in their life. And I would mm -hmm. say for most of us, like the first big milestone is getting through college and getting a job. And that yeah. for me was, you know, 
important. But when you're 20 and you're in college yeah. and and trying to figure out what you want to do with your life and trying to figure out what career you're going to have and trying to appease your parents who are obviously maybe well-intentioned but tend to be a little afraid of the idea of saying you want to pursue art or video right. games or animation or whatever um your initial target is getting a job mm -hmm. you know and your dream is to get a job um but once that happens and you get your first job the reality is you're a junior and i think it becomes very aware once you get into the workplace that there are people that have 10 20 40 years more experience than you do mm -hmm. um and uh and then you start to understand the lifelong learning evolutionary aspect of being an artist you know and being on a team and uh as and hopefully seeing that as a positive you know yeah. i think artists often are introverted and insecure i would definitely describe myself as that way for as a teenager and you know mm -hmm. um for a, quite a while and and there's a lot of things i still remain insecure about because it's just the nature of being an artist that you mm -hmm question everything you do and whether what you sure. did was good or not and you know and being aware of all the people that you admire who are so much better than you are and like those those you know feelings tend to not go away like sure. i could go to art station right now and look at stuff and just be like oh my god <laughs> yeah i've got to ration that for myself <laughs> yeah that's normal um but you have to have the faith that like well once you kind of get through college and get your first job mm -hmm. that you can continue to get better and getting better is really just a matter of putting in the time mm -hmm. you know it's it is that simple and so you create milestones for yourself where it's like for me this year like i want to learn on real so for me 2021 was the year starting in may of like mm -hmm. i'm finally going to try out unreal knowing that for the first you know month i'm gonna know nothing i'm gonna feel like an idiot i'm gonna have a million questions i'm gonna be looking for people i can ask questions to going on google going on youtube you know watching noman tutorials whatever i can find and uh and i will feel inadequate i will feel like a buffoon playing with this tool i don't know but i know after years of doing this that if i put in obsessive hours which is the way i am right like i find <laughs> something i love and from the morning i from when i wake up till i go to bed i just want to sure. do that and i just know like if i play with unreal 80 hours a week for a month by the end of the month i will know more than i knew at the beginning of the month it doesn't mean i'm going to be an expert it just means i'm going to know more and now that i've been using it for six months like there's still so much about it i don't know but at least i now know enough to make environments which is kind yeah. of what I wanted to learn it for. So you just mm -hmm. have to have the patience to allow yourself to suck, right? Yes, yes. And and not be have any self-doubt from the fact that you're not good at something, as long as you have the faith that if you keep trying, you will get better. Yeah. So you can, you know, so from a scale of, you know, like I really suck, now I suck less, and now I'm not so bad, and now I'm okay. It's like it's a ladder, and you just have to let yourself climb that ladder and, and not be disheartened by all the people out there who are higher up the ladder who have already put the time in and are mm -hmm. better than you. You know, you have to, you know, definitely never allow yourself to have the opinion that people are better than you because of a gene or because they're lucky oh, gosh, yeah. or because of something that is completely out of your control you know yes. like i have not met any artist who's really good who will not say that it's because of time and hard work yeah i've never you know i've met thousands of artists uh mm -hmm. and a lot of top top artists too and all of the top artists and art directors and people in the industry working at weta and ilm all of everybody same thing yeah. i have been obsessed with this stuff since i was a kid i work my ass off i love it i am only good because of passion not mm -hmm. because it just came to me, you know, like the idea of the savant, you know, right. like uh, Mozart um, is is like such an anomaly, mm -hmm. you know, that it represents like a thousandth of a percent of creative yeah. people. Yeah. And then people like to focus on that as an exciting story of like, oh, well, but Mozart was writing symphonies when he was 10 or Michelangelo did the David when he was 20. Mm -hmm. Like oh my god! Like, <laughs> like, but even those guys were the hard. conversation. Oh well, yeah. for sure. But they were yeah. still anomalies in a landscape yes. of people that ultimately just have to work hard to get good. Well, and you mentioned something earlier that I think is so important is you're, especially the entertainment industry. 
especially mm -hmm. being a CG artist, it is by nature collaborative. You are a part of an ecosystem that makes yeah. things great. So yeah. I think that in and of itself helps to relieve some of this pressure of like, I have to be the best at everything. Um, and I think the younger an artist is, the fewer times they've had the opportunity to go through that gauntlet of like sucking and then getting better. But I think after you've gone through that a few times with a few different disciplines, you start to trust that process. Like mm -hmm. that feeling of sucking and having growth edges and having somebody come along and even point something out like, hey, that needs to improve. That starts to be great news because you yeah. know that you're going to develop, you know, you're going to get better. Yeah. And that's, and that's what Noman represents in the end, you know, is, is mm -hmm. Noman, you know, a lot of people look at Noman student work um, or the, or the reels we post every year and get intimidated by that thinking like, well, mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm not that good. And so, you know, I don't know if I can do this. And it's like, well, it's the whole point of a school like Noman existing is to help people get from point A to point B, you know, is, is yes. to help people be able to be, uh, to have the passion and the interest and the curiosity, you know, and then take that potential and transform that into a skill set and a portfolio that allows you to start a career in the industry, you know, and, and that's why people go to school. You know, you don't go to med school because you're already a doctor. You know, mm -hmm. you don't go to <laughs> law school because you already understand law. It's because yeah. you're curious about learning about that subject that you yes. are passionate about. And so, uh, so with art school, whether it's Noman or any other art school teaching anything from painting to sculpture to whatever, it's, it's just about the same thing. Like, is this yep. something you're excited about doing? Is this something you're curious about? And, and that's why Noman exists is to, is to help with what you were saying earlier, people to find their community, find like-minded people who are supportive, you know, yep. and, uh, and will help. And, and that that's really what I've always wanted Noman to be is just a a community of kind, open minded people that are helping each other become better artists in an industry that I am incredibly passionate about. Yes. Well, and the amazing thing, too, I think at a school like Noman, where because the nature of what Noman teaches is ever evolving, mm -hmm. um, you know, you you still you you've got the artist out there that would be the equivalent of going through med school and being a doctor for you know even 10 plus years some of these artists are still coming back to Noman and being a beginner again learning something new if you're in an unreal class mm -hmm. uh, where you're using unreal as a tool at Noman you could feel like you really suck but you could be sitting next to a studio veteran who's learning unreal right. for the first time and you guys get to go through that process together yeah. um yeah, and let's let's talk really briefly about. Um, I know that Noman has been developing some new um, educational offerings mm -hmm. uh, for for things like virtual production, but specifically Unreal Engine. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I think uh, I mean going through the Unreal Fellowship in May is something that people have been doing just because there aren't a lot of people out there using Unreal for that application, and so mm -hmm. virtual production is a buzzword. Right. Um, which a lot of people would say just is a buzzword. It's just production. But really what people are referring to is the Mandalorian thing, mm -hmm. um, which is using Unreal to try and do photo reel images and animation. And so on the virtual production side, it tends to refer to having a stage that has a bunch of LED panels, but thousands of them to basically create a full immersive space that can be very large. Uh, of these LED walls that Unreal is basically driving and putting environments and scenes onto those LED walls that actors can then be lit by, so they look like they're there, while also being the background that's in camera. So it's in camera effects, as opposed to shooting actors on a green screen and adding right. it later, right? So that's become a very popular application of Unreal. And so the fellowship was kind of meant to teach people the basics of that, but because so few people have been doing it, it's starting to grow. So part of going through that and what Epic's interest is, is to have schools start to teach the stuff as well. And so by going through the fellowship and then Miguel and Tran who work at Noman went through the fellowship, mm -hmm. Josh Herman uh, from Noman went through the fellowship. So we have four people who went through it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in talking to the industry and talking to studios about how the difficulty they're having finding unreal people, um, because right now studios are having difficulty finding people who know how to do, use Unreal to do photo reel final pixel work. Um, there was a heavy demand for us to add those types of classes. And so 
so we spent the fall developing curriculum for those classes and then starting next term, which starts in like a week, then we have four new virtual production classes with Unreal. So we still have all of our game art classes with Unreal, but now mm -hmm. we're going to have a series of five classes that are specific to virtual production. So one which is just called virtual production, which is what is going on on sound stages around the world right now with virtual production, whether it's film projects like the Avatar sequels to things mm -hmm. like what's going on at Happy Mushroom or studios that are doing things like Mandalorian, Boba Fett, Obi-Wan, whatever. Um, and uh, so the virtual production class is more on like, what are LED volumes? What are the stages? What are in-camera tools in Unreal? And then we have sort of fundamental Unreal classes now for mm -hmm. production. So one on building environments, one on animation, one on effects, world building, um, but more for the, you're going to be rendering animations out of Unreal as opposed to you're making a game. Mm -hmm. and so, uh, so yeah, so we're excited about those classes and we have a lot of studios that are interested in those classes. So that's a very unique thing about Nomen is like, again, Nomen started because I was trainer going to studios every day doing support yeah and so when nomen opened far long before we had full-time programs or degrees or things like that nomen did a lot of studio training um and uh and to this day we still do so like three yeah. days ago i spoke to the director and manager of training for netflix animation um because of the needs netflix has for training some of their artists and so things like adding these virtual production classes are both for our full-time students as well as for industry. And so I think that's yeah. a very unique thing about Nomen is that, you know, our, our customer in the end is the industry. Yes. Whether it's the students that are graduating or whether it's the artists from studios that are taking classes and it's a mixed environment. So there aren't, you know, I don't know of other schools that are mixed in the way that Nomen are is really, you know, there's maybe a couple, mm -hmm. um, but we are kind of unique in that way and that it's a mixed population. So you could be a degree student studying with an extension student who works at a studio. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but I think that's the cool thing about Nomen that oh, yeah. our classes are considered to be good enough for studio artists. And yet you're a 20 year old learning how to get in the industry in the same class with the same teacher. Yeah who are well, all industry professionals. Exactly. Yeah, no, you're learning from a studio artist alongside people who may be studio artists. Mm -hmm. um, and it's this beautiful mix of like, everybody's just going to the place where they can, they can push it all forward. Um, we and we don't, we've got some pretty heavy hitters teaching some of these new uh, classes involving Unreal. Mm -hmm. um, like, I think Dane Smith is one of our one yeah. of our uh, instructors yeah. who if you don't know who that is like literally has been involved with the with pioneering this mm -hmm. um and all these projects that you mentioned um i mean I think it's an before, important part yeah. of Nomen. i mean it, it, that's been the thing for me since day one is who are the teachers yeah you know and i would say that to anybody that's curious about school for anything is like who are the teachers you know um that was my issue when i went to my first college Mm -hmm. right it's like why are these people qualified to be teaching me because i had art classes in regular college like a liberal arts college that were very fine art oriented mm -hmm. and uh, while i was into fantasy and sci-fi and comics and illustration and stuff like that meaning like frazetta and beasley and Absolutely. you know yeah. and stuff like that and uh and the fine art scene is not something i'm a fan of um, because it's not a meritocracy it's not about you know uh it, it's more about marketing and sales and it is mm. an, an art as a commodity than it is about what we're into you know and uh and i found that very frustrating where i had teachers who were authorities but i didn't really understand how they were in that position mm -hmm. and then i went to another school an art school and it was the same thing where like the teachers were sort of tenured staff maybe they did something cool 30 years ago but in an industry like ours where it's, which is constantly changing right that wasn't very helpful it's fine for something like a perspective class or an, or an anatomy class those things don't change you know mm -hmm. but for something like an animation class an effects class whatever like those things keep changing so i was really disheartened by that and that was why i dropped out of my second college to take the job at alias wavefront because at alias at least i knew i was going to be around professionals yeah. going to studios doing support but also learning from them yeah and in that job, I realized how much I still had to learn. And starting Nomen as a training facility to teach studio artists really just meant getting studio artists to have a place in Hollywood where they could come together 
share ideas with each other. So that Nomen was like the only place in LA where artists from all the studios were gathering mm -hmm. and sharing information. Yeah. And, uh, and that to me meant that they were qualified, that I knew that any teacher that we were bringing in, like, oh, well, you work at Digital Domain, you work at Disney, you work at, you know, Pixelmondo or the Mill or MPC or the scores of studios that are in LA, they were qualified. Mm -hmm. And to this day, that that's what Nomen represents is that, you yeah. know, all of our teachers are qualified to be teaching what they're teaching. You know, they're all working in the industry so that uh, I think it's important, you know, like it, it's L.A. is a hub for the industry mm -hmm. and, and any school that's not in a hub, that's problematic, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and it, Nomen, I, when I talk with, with people about the school, I like to say, you know, it's it's an education by industry artists for industry yeah. artists but i think before nomen was a, a school or any any sort of like i mean it was always an education but i think what people associate with education mm -hmm. um and culture it was really this hub this community of artists that were all collaborating and learning from one another yeah. and then teaching um not unlike you know van gogh's yellow house or some of these other early art collectives that formed uh that led to the atelier movement um well, and, and I think you've also really, you've already answered what my last, you know, question set was going to be is that a lot of people ask me, okay, you're using a term called industry ready, and you're mm -hmm. associating that with an education program. Mm -hmm. um, how does Nomen accomplish that? And it really is everything that you've just outlined. It's yeah. those are, that's the secret sauce, everything that you've talked about up until now. And the fact that when you started Nomen, you were not setting out to, I am going to start a business and it's going to be a school. You right. were you were creating the education that you knew was needed because it's what you needed as well. Yeah. And it's still that way. I mean, it's like the yeah. you know, the effects animation with Unreal class that's new that's starting, you know, this term is a class that I'm very interested in because that's something that there's not a lot of resources and information out there on how to use Niagara, which is like the new effects system in Unreal. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of Nomen workshop titles or classes at Nomen or events that we've done that are based on, you know, my own personal curiosity on how something mm -hmm. was done, you know, and yeah. so. Well, I right. think everybody at Nomen feels that way. I mean, I, the events that I get to host, I don't, it doesn't feel like a job. I get to go, I, I get to talk to who? I get to learn from whom, you know, we're going to talk about this and that. Um, in our remaining time, I want to be able to jump into some of the questions that have come in from the chat. Um, and mm -hmm. thanks everybody who's, who's been hanging out and commenting and asking questions. Um, also some, just some great observations and compliments, people giving props to the student reel and, and the artwork that our students are creating. Uh, one of the questions that has come in uh, is, what do you uh, the nature of the question is about the future of 3d and what do you think the role of virtual reality will take in the industry or do you think it's more of a a temporary kind of stepping stone to something else um well i mean my view on vr is that it's a monitor right, right. it's a monitor on your face so we used to use little monitors and then 20 inch monitors, and now it's common to have a 30 inch monitor. So whether the monitor is bigger or whether it's attached to your head, it's like, you're still just making visuals that are being seen by people. Mm -hmm. So the, the VR thing, I don't think really in, ended up changing anything, right? Like the rise of VR and Oculus and Vive and all that stuff over the last few years, it didn't change anything in regards to what's getting made. Yeah, some mm -hmm. VR games came out that, uh, we're taking advantage of the fact that you're in a 3D space wearing a headset. But this, the responsibility of the artists, the environment artists and the character artists and the effects artists and the art directors and everybody involved in making that title was the same as whether it was for VR or not, really mostly the same. Yeah. So I don't necessarily see things like the metaverse and, uh, you know, somebody made a comment about Ready Player One, which, you know, obviously, uh, I mean, I read the book and the sequel and Armada, his other book. And like, you know, I'm a fan of Ernest Klein and of, you know, Snowcraft and Mona Lisa, Lisa Overdrive and Neuromancer and like all the VR stuff I'm a fan mm -hmm. of going to the matrix also, except for the new one. And uh, yeah, VR is already here. It's just low fidelity and not a global community. And so I think that, yeah, it's going to continue to be a thing, but as, as an artist, I don't think it's it's going to be such a slow evolution to get there that right now, if you're interested in that stuff, it's just like, well, you still need to learn 3D tools. 
Yeah, because that's basically what's going to use be used to make all of that content. So I yeah. think uh, I don't know if it changes much. You know, like the metaverse thing right now, everybody's talking about. It's just a big buzzword that huge corporations are using to try and jockey themselves into position for some kind of cash grab that they don't understand. Because I don't think anybody really knows what the metaverse means. Yeah. Well, and like you said, as a creator, it's like it, it, all of these buzzwords and cash grabs and all those kind of things are going to come and go like weathered patterns. But the yep. thing that never changes is learning art and yeah. learning how to create art in 3D. That will always be that's never going to change. It's always going to be necessary. Yeah. Um, another question that's come in. Uh, let's see. Uh, one of our viewers was curious to know, um, you know, do you have any thoughts on how close we might be to something like Unreal in real time developing enough that it can incorporate, you know, more of what we're needing to use other engines for, like hero characters and, and more than environments and stuff like that? I mean, Unreal 5 is going to be coming out soon, and Unreal 5 is amazing for environment work, but there's still mm -hmm. a lot that they need to do on the character <coughs> side. It's like the metahumans are definitely impressive, but mm -hmm. there's still a lot of work that needs to happen there. So I think it's just going to continue to get better. There's no like specific milestone other than constant change and evolution. So I think for it depends. For people that are curious about tools and tech, I think it's like, where do you want to work? What kind of project do you want to be on and, and make a decision based on what those studios are using mm -hmm. um but uh so yeah i mean I, I think unreal is something that wasn't really talked about in the film animation industry it was a game engine like mm -hmm. say, three four years ago now people are using it in that space but like i said earlier it's a tool that you have to use in conjunction with other things you know so like the project yes. i'm working on now where i'm making environments like mm -hmm. if i need a mountain range i'm going to make that in world machine or gaia you know uh if i need you know uh some like ground plane surfaces that my scene's going to be moving over then i'm going to go into zbrush and start sculpting those and then i'm going to bring those in the mixer by quixel and start texturing those like still not in unreal yet you know um if I need trees, then I'm going to go into speed tree and make the trees over there. So again, Unreal is kind of like scene assembly. So it's just being mm -hmm. aware of what are all the different tools that you need to know based on a skill set and, and approaching those. So Unreal as a all-in-one isn't really, it's really not meant to be an all-in-one. It's meant to to play well with others. No. Yeah. And and I, that's, I think uh, sometimes uh, with the evolution of technology and how amazing it's becoming, Mm -hmm. Sometimes the tendency can be see like, give me the one, the one be all end all. What's the one silver bullet software to learn? Which at the end of the day, it's just more art tools. You know, yeah. you've got I mean, you, paint, you, generally tools. you start with the hub software. Like, what's your hub? You know, and so like Maya is a is a is a hub tool, and so like if you're gonna talk about something you could use as an all in one, like you know, there are people who can just use Maya and make incredible stuff, or just use Houdini and right. make incredible stuff. So like Maya, Houdini, Blender. You know, for those who are getting started and interested in learning 3D blenders, obviously what a lot of people are excited about right now because it's free. Um, these are all in one tool. So like you can sculpt in Maya and you can sculpt in Blender, right? But not at the fidelity you can in ZBrush. Mm -hmm. um, you can make a tree using paint effects in Maya, but it's not nearly as powerful of an engine as using speed tree. So we right now there's just all these specialty tools that are really good at specific things. Yeah. While something like Maya, Houdini, Blender are like these all in ones that are good at a lot of things, but as you evolve with your skill set and you get comfortable and then you decide, you know what, I really need to bring my trees to the next level. Mm -hmm. What did they use to do all the trees in Pandora? You know, what does ILM use to do trees? And that's where you're like, oh, okay, maybe I should learn speed tree. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing is that a lot of these specialty tools are a lot smaller. So like it doesn't take as long to learn speed tree or world machine as it does to learn Maya. Yeah. So I uh and it's it, where it's it, where it's all going in this whole scene assembly thing that you can do in Unreal, it reminds me a little bit of uh uh Blade Runner uh 2049 when Kay visits the person that's like literally making the memories that people oh, yeah. people and, and they're and they're just like boop, 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 you know, just using this little device mm -hmm. and putting it all together. It's like we're kind of doing that now, which is amazing. Yeah, I mean, full real time, like she's doing in there where everything yeah. looks completely photo real and is real time, and she can basically just have some weird neural connection to the mm -hmm. system that's being able to visualize whatever she wants. I think that's coming. 
Yeah. Right. Like what's what's in that the idea of that, right? I do think is coming. Yeah. I just don't think it's coming anytime soon. But I think that's <laughs> the trajectory we're on, right. right? Like like right now, if you're in Unreal, which is real time and you know, you can put on a headset in Unreal and be looking around, but mm -hmm. like you're just like, okay, now I want some snow. It's not like there's some photo real snow tool in our room. <laughs> right. yeah. You know, like you're going to have to go and make it from scratch or go on Marketplace and try and find somebody who made snow, but then it's hard to find good assets on Marketplace. So yeah. it's like right now there's always this like, oh, now I need this. And then there's this slow down to make it as opposed to what she's doing where the tool, whatever software she's using in that movie, mm -hmm. clearly is able to do anything completely right. photo real. Uh, right. By her just saying, now I want some snow over there, or now I want some kids around a table with a birthday cake. Yeah. And it's able to just extrapolate through some kind of AI algorithm, a completely photoreal scene with photoreal kids. It's like, yeah, well, you look at meta humans and they look good. Right. They, they don't look like photoreal people yet. So yeah. it's a great example of the way that, you know, we're creating stuff for an entertainment industry that is visualizing what the future of that industry could look like. And we're moving towards it and when we can do all that stuff you know noman will be teaching people how to um yeah which will yeah. be really cool <laughs> and hopefully we're still around for that um but uh yeah it, it's just a couple more questions i know that we're we're getting to the end of our time uh, i did see the one uh question come in about what vfx courses are available at noman and if we teach vfx the kind of vfx you see like in transformers and iron man movies absolutely yes, and the sure. people we have teaching those courses have worked on <laughs> those films so yeah. definitely go browse the individual courses at noman yeah no um, i mean we have over 100 courses at noman so and anything that has to do with 3d computer graphics for the most part from a film meaning visual effects you know you want to work at weta ilm the mill mpc those kind of places you know, animation, meaning you want to work at Disney, DreamWorks, and, and work in the feature animation industry, you mm -hmm. know, or the game industry as from a game art perspective, as opposed to a programming perspective. Yeah. Gnome is an art school. And so those are the industries that we focus on and have classes on on all of those things. So whether you want to be doing photoreal visual effects for the Avatar sequels at Weta or ILM, you know, whether you want to do stylized, you know, graphics at a place like Riot or Blizzard, whether you want to, you know, those are all the sort of industries that we, we focus on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, yeah, we have tons of classes and have students to go on to do all those different things, which is awesome. Yeah, there's a, a, a really, I forget who it was from and what project it is. And I'm sure that this story exists in more than one iteration at Noman. But mm -hmm. the story goes, some Noman students were sitting around their workstations in a lab uh, and what they were doing for an assignment was they were redoing a VFX shot from a well-known film. Mm -hmm. And as they're working on it and struggling with solving those problems, literally the person that made that shot walks by and goes, oh, what are you doing? You got yeah. any questions? And I'm like, oh, well, you know, it's it's this thing. And, and they were like, well, I made that. So if you have any questions about it, you know, I'll help you out. Um, I think that's, that's incredible about Noman. Um, Let's see here. I'm going to grab just one more question from the chat. And sorry, I've not been. No, able I'm to happy to answer any of the questions. I'm not on a oh, time sure. crunch. Oh, okay. Um, very good then. Let's let's keep going through. Uh, there's been a, just some 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 great compliments on our our education at Noman. Uh, some questions about online classes, and I, I can speak to that after our time with Alex. I'll be giving a brief presentation um, mm -hmm. about Noman if you want to stick around for that. And let's see. But I saw somebody said, uh, "Are you gonna the new Unreal and digital production class is going to be integrated in the BFA program or just standalone courses?" That's a good question because that's something that's been in evolution with Noman. Where, whenever there's new tech, like we were the first school to teach Maya, the first school to teach ZBrush. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, again, we've been around for 25 years, and uh, and so whenever there's new things that that pop up that start becoming used in the industry, Noman will start teaching those things because it's important for a our studio uh artist students people working that need uh to stay on top of new tools mm -hmm. and for our curtain students but if there's a brand new piece of software that uh people are starting to use we'll add courses for it and it'll be extension in the beginning meaning that it's a extension class it's not in program because we're working out the curriculum it's brand new and then if it seems like okay this is clearly now a paradigm shift that's occurred all the studios are starting to adopt this software and this technique then that's when it'll get integrated into the full-time programs. And so we do already have virtual production in 
the full-time programs for certain tracks, mm -hmm. a single virtual production class, and then these new classes that have just been added that are starting for the first time next week, these four new Unreal classes, then I would say, yes, they will end up being integrated into the full-time program at some point over the next, you know, probably, you know, 18 months. And yeah. So, uh, but, you know, students at Nomenga have uh, electives. And so that's where we make decisions with these new classes is maybe they become electives. And so that once mm -hmm. you get your upper terms and you decide, okay, well, Unreal for virtual production isn't part of my core curriculum, but I'd like to take it as an elective, then that's where that stuff starts to emerge, where generally these like new uh, paradigms enter as electives first and then they might become core classes later because we're always evolving the curriculum grids for yeah. our different programs yeah every i think every year there's definitely more than one kind of evolutionary step that happens of constantly yeah. adjusting it um because yeah we that the industry relevance is really the key it's every student that graduates from Noman is 100 percent relevant to the state of the industry yeah. Uh, that they graduate into. Yeah. Uh, there's another question. Somebody was wanting to know if we might perchance get to see any uh, Nomen workshops from you uh, yeah. on creating environments and so forth. I mean, I'm overdue. It's been a while since I've made mm -hmm. a Nomen workshop title. And so, but now that I'm spending so much time making environments in Unreal, then I wouldn't be surprised if I end up doing something. Um, but I don't know when. Like right now, the project I'm on. Uh, has like another month to go. And um, I've learned a lot in the last six weeks that I've been on it because um, mm -hmm. I'm building, I'm working with an artist named Las Mort, a musician. And uh, back in May, when I did my fellowship short, um, I had to figure out what song I was going to use or what track I was going to use for the short. And I've been a fan of Las Mort for a really long time. Um, and so there was a specific track of his. And I had actually met him years ago. Mm. Because when Meets Meyer was a resident artist at Nomen, Meets is a, he's now the virtual art department supervisor for uh, Obi-Wan at Happy Mushroom, although I think he might be off Obi-Wan now. But anyway, Meets was a resident artist at Nomen a long time ago. And when Meets was a resident artist at Nomen, he got an email one day. He was actually, he lived with me for a few months. And he got an email one day from Tool, the band, mm -hmm. which he thought was fake, just saying like, hey, we'd like you to do some visuals for us. And flash forward many many years meets has done lots of animation for tool and maynard and uh and one day like 15 years ago meets uh brought over to noman uh adam jones the guitarist from tool and mm -hmm. this guy lusmord and so i actually met them like 15 years ago which was oh, around wow. and uh and started listening to lusmord and anyway he does like dark ambient music which i've been a fan of for a long time so i'd met him once 15 years ago at noman and uh and i reached out to him asking if i could uh use one of his tracks for my short and he said uh and he was cool about it <coughs> and so my unreal short has a track called babble by lusmord and then a couple months ago uh and this was six months seven months ago and then a couple months ago he uh reached out and uh and asked if i'd be interested in doing some visuals for an upcoming uh show he has in europe uh he released a new album last year called alter with Karen Park. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's a beautiful album. It's really, really, really cool. And uh, uh, they're going to be performing it at a festival in Europe in the spring and asked if I would do visuals for the show. So that's what I'm working awesome. on. Now. And so awesome. making lots and lots of slow camera moves over environments in, uh, in Unreal. So that's been awesome. So, you know, I'd say at some point in the next you know, a few months, I wouldn't be surprised if I end up making a Nomen Workshop title on what I've learned about making environments in Unreal. Mm -hmm. That would be really cool. Um, sounds like we've got a lot of people who'd be interested in that. Yeah, I I got into uh, Less More a bit from you, from yeah. hearing about them from you. And I, I love finding new ambient stuff to listen to for when I'm when I'm designing or creating art and that kind of stuff. I love his music. It's very dark, but it's it reminds me a lot of the Scandinavian landscape uh, for some reason. Well, Karen, Karen Park, who, who did the new album with, she lives in Norway. Uh, OK, and so that's some of the inspiration for the next environment I have to do is is going to be in that direction. Awesome. Scouting trip to Norway, then that would be nice. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a fantastic place. It's worth visiting. Um, let's see here. A couple more questions. Let's see. 
Uh, what are your thoughts on the remote workflow for artists after the pandemic is over? Um, well, I think it's it's here to stay for certain studios. I think mm -hmm. that uh, you know a lot of studios are reopening and bringing people back, while a lot of studios have really enjoyed the remote workflow uh, or the remote office. Mm -hmm. So, for example, while some studios, uh, the campus isn't going anywhere, and they and artists are back uh, working on site. There's certain places like where Meets Works, Happy Mushrooms, that said that they're going to stay remote permanently and that everybody can work from home. So Meets just moved out to Joshua Tree um, because oh, wow. you realize, okay. like, well, we can be anywhere. So That's great. they just bought a house out there, which is pretty cool. That's um, awesome. But uh, Aaron Sims, who I talked to yesterday for a while, um, they had an office in Burbank. He's really enjoyed the whole uh, work from home remote thing because it allows them now everybody's now comfortable working remotely and working with artists that are all over the world as opposed to just in LA yeah so he sees it for his studio which was a small studio like 30 people um it being very very valuable that, that now everybody's comfortable working from home and using zoom and all of the tools that people are now using to collaborate online mm -hmm. so it kind of depends on on the studio you know like obviously anything that's real production on set on stages has to be in person in that way so virtual production and all these led walls then places that cities where they have those kind of facilities are, are going to be in person and la is a city that's all about live action production um so i think it but like you know riot 2000 people blizzard 3000 people in irvine like those offices aren't going anywhere because in the end being physically together has a lot of advantages as well sure. from an efficiency and uh perspective and a collaborative perspective mm -hmm. so it's it's i think it's been a positive i think our industry adapted really well uh to the pandemic our industry has grown like crazy over the last two years um that's one thing with the entertainment industry in general that i've seen is that it's counter cyclical to recessions you know that whenever there's a economic downturn that our industry tends to do better because people want to watch more movies and play more video games and and the content that we produce is an important part of getting people through these pandemics you know yeah. and getting through difficult times so i think we're all aware that there's more shows than we've ever seen and uh so many things are in production which is all positive so the remote workforce thing is i think here to stay but it's not you know it's, it, we're going to be hybrid yeah going it's going to replace it, there's yeah. no way for it to fully replace but it, it's a good time to be you know i think historically if you were an artist living in the middle of nowhere you know another country in a town somewhere where maybe it was difficult to work in the industry because the studios didn't want to hire remote people um that perspective has started to shift and i think mm. studios are now a lot more open to hiring people that are remote so that's i think for from a global perspective for artists out there that's a positive it yeah, we definitely developed an, a better infrastructure for that out of necessity yeah. uh, because of the pandemic um uh, another question that's come in is uh how how common has it been or how often have you ever seen grads from Nomen pretty much going straight into freelance or generally do they go you know spend some time as a junior artist at a studio before they do that i think it's a horrible idea to go freelance i think that that people should go to a studio so yes, there are students who have, but in generally, no. Generally, you go to a studio. You need to meet people. You, yeah. need to be, you need to build your network. You need to work at a studio. You need to see what a professional pipeline's like um, and, and do that for a while before going freelance. You know, And ultimately, working at a studio is, like, is social. You're around people. You're meeting people, going to lunch with people, uh, building your friend network. I mean, from a social perspective as a human, like being at a studio is awesome. And uh, and going freelance, I think, for some people meant the opportunity to work from home or to work mm -hmm. from anywhere, which now, because of the whole remote thing we just talked about, is easier to do anyway. So I think going freelance is, is something that uh, it's best to work professionally for a little while before you go down the freelance road. That's, that's, and I, that's what really the majority of our students do, yeah. is work for a studio first. Yeah. It's, it's part of it's that you know becoming industry ready as we discussed earlier doesn't mean you don't have anything left to learn it sets you up to join that industry to continue your learning yeah. um as you're working the pipeline um and, uh, i think emil just said 
looking at the Houdini classes in summer term, I want to know if Houdini individual classes kind of the same as taught in full programs. Yes, they're the same classes. So all of the classes that are in the programs and the classes that are individual, are all the same classes, uh, same curriculum, same teachers. Awesome. Um, well, Alex, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Um, I, I love, I, I think one of the, one of the really cool things that I always get when I get to speak with you is you're fully in it now, but you're also, you've got this really great perspective on the history of CG. And I think that CG has come enough of a long way that you, we could actually have a history of that. Um, and I think that's so important. Uh, and another reason why it's good to get into an academic environment where you can learn about that. Um, especially for those that were born into you know, born after a lot of these uh, innovations that have come out. Um, so guys, as we as we wrap with Alex, um, I will be sticking around for about another 15 to 20 minutes, just sharing about how you can get access to some of Noman's educational offerings, going a little bit more in depth into our programs and, and what we're doing to train artists. Um, but uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, and uh, I hope that you continue to make the awesome progress that you're making with Unreal and the project that you're working on everything. Awesome, thanks, man. Yeah. All right. See Talk you later. later. Bye. Okay, everybody. Well, that was great. Um, and thanks for all the thoughtful question guys in the chat. Um, so for those of you who would like to learn more about Noman, I'm going to take just a little bit of time uh, to share that with you and get my screen share set up here. There we go. And uh, I'm just going to grab this over here as well. Okay. So, you know, um, Together with Alex, we've actually managed to cover a lot of ground about what Nomen is and why Nomen is and what we do. Um, but yeah, that it, essentially you heard it at the top of the stream. Alex started Nomen back in 1997, um, and this was a time where that massive demand for CG artists was was just really booming. Um, so we managed to jump in, and because we were that hub for artists to both come and learn as well as teach that growing industry. Um, we very quickly um, snowballed into becoming a full-blown full-time uh, school. Uh, and now we also have been offering for some years a uh, full Bachelor of Fine Arts degree, a four-year program um, in digital production. Uh, these are examples of some of the awards that we won over the years, but you know, we're in our 25th year now, um, where we just, I think we're just about to wrap 25 years of being a school, which is amazing. Um, so all of that, just to build the perspective, we've been around for two and a half decades. Uh, we're very good at what we do, uh, and because of that, our graduates go on to work on some really incredible projects. These are all examples of uh, somewhat recent projects that Noman grads have worked on uh, and continue to work on out there in the industry. And these are some of the more well-known studios. I mean, there's over well over 800 studios just in the Los Angeles area alone, but these are some of the ones that you might recognize that are regularly hiring graduates from the Noman full-time programs. And you'll see at the top there, um, something we call industry placement and a percentile. What that means is that is the percentage of students from who have graduated from Noman's full-time programs that find their first job in the industry doing exactly what they trained to do at Noman within just six months of finishing the program, uh, which is pretty incredible. Uh, so when you hear Alex say that, you know, we exist to uh, service the industry, that is exactly what we're doing. Um, and because we know what studios are looking for, because we know the studios and we work with them, we're able to um, give artists the education they need to have the 100% relevant skill sets. And that's the reason why over 50, over 50 studios come to just the Noman campus alone uh, four times out of the year. They'll show up for something we call um, employer preview day. And this is an opportunity for um, art directors as well as recruiters from studios to come out and meet Noman students. Um, typically, what that experience looks like in education for art is the student needs to go to some kind of job fair. They need to get in a line uh, and, and wait a long time for each individual studio that they want to be able to show their portfolio to. At Noman, the studios are the ones that come and get in line to see our students. So our students get to be at the same in the same lab that they've been working on their work in at a workstation, and they can show their portfolio um, in real time and often uh, as these uh, recruiters from studios come through it's where the initial conversation that ultimately leads to a job uh, happens uh, so that's one of the things that's very intrinsic to our mission at Noman. so what are artists learning um, in in a term and this is an industry term that encompasses a wide range of skill sets we are teaching digital production that is the focus of all of Noman's programs 
Um, Noman's very much teaching a niche of a niche of the art world, but we are bringing all of the things that have always been true for art and foundational art skills and teaching those and then serving that one niche skill set. Uh, so it would be like if you took a traditional uh, art university and you took just one department, digital production for entertainment, out of that school and you blew it up into being a full-time program, a full-blown college that can leverage all of its resources towards that. So what we're doing. Um, but digital production encompasses a broad range of skills. These would be things like visual uh, or computer-based visual effects, character and creature design, digital sculpting uh, and software like ZBrush, character and creature animation, environment design, uh, which we've been talking with Alex about, lighting and rendering, map painting and compositing, um, game asset creation, working within game engines like Unreal Engine, uh, production workflows and world building. Um, and each of those skills translate into the following careers. So these are examples of the roles and the, the titles for those roles that you'll see if you stick around for the credits uh, for you know some of these huge films like uh, Endgame and whatnot, uh, which I like to do. If you stay long enough to see, you know, as it gets into 3D artists and CG artists and visual effects, that's generally when <laughs> the most names are on the screen at any one time because they've got to fit hundreds upon hundreds of names respective to these roles uh, in the credits. And that in and of itself should show you that there's a massive, massive demand uh, for these particular careers. Uh, and you can take a look at them. There's a, there's a lot of different ones that sound very different from one another because they are. Uh, Noman will actually teach all of these. It will teach the entire pipeline and then it, get, build that as a foundation and a skill set for you to zero in on what you're truly passionate about doing. But I'd like to show you some examples of four of these, starting out with character artists. A character artist is essentially the artist that brings a sketch, or as you can see on the screen here, up in the upper left-hand corner, brings a sketch or a concept of a character or creature to life into that that fully realized 3D character creature that the audience is going to be interacting with in a game or seeing on screen um, in a film or television show. Uh, this artist here is using a piece of software called ZBrush, which uh, essentially it's been around for quite a while. It's an incredibly innovative piece of software because it allows you to use traditional clay sculpting techniques with digital clay, as you can see here on the screen. So it's perfect for creating characters, creatures, even organic shapes that you would find in nature. Uh, artists that uh, go on to become character artists are generally artists that are also very passionate about drawing characters and creatures, or that's just kind of where they live and what they love. So if you're really into, um, you know, if you're spending time drawing characters and creatures and you're really interested in that world, this could be a career path that would be interesting to you. Uh, next up are effects artists. And these are the artists that, uh, you know, I like to affectionately say they spend their entire day in front of a computer blowing things up. Uh, as you can see here in uh, this VFX uh, reel for uh, Gravity, which won some awards some years back for its visual effects. Um, you know, these are artists that uh, if they were, uh, the metaphor, if they were a member of a D&D campaign, if they were a, a character class in D&D, they'd probably be the sorcerer or the magician or something like that, because they're constantly taking the director's vision uh, for something fantastical that needs to happen like this and making it real, bringing it into something that's believable. Um, and because these scenes are so complex, you can't use traditional animation techniques like you would go in and, and, and by hand, you know, move a character's facial expression or, or limbs and whatnot. They are using specialized software that drives simulations of real world physics. They manipulate those, those physics simulations like a wizard would to create stunning sequences like these. Uh, where it seems bigger than life, but it feels like it's in life because things like gravity and water and smoke and all these different kinds of particles and energies that you're seeing feel believable in the way that that artist has uh, simulated them and brought them to life artistically. Next up are compositors. The compositor is pretty much at the very end of the pipeline, uh, for example, for uh, creating a film. Uh, they are the one that they don't necessarily build all of the other stuff previous to them in the pipeline. They're not, they're not creating the animations or building the models or doing the lighting and the texturing, but they receive all of that work and they weave it together. So like here you see, this is a shot from Wolf of Wall Street and uh, the background and tennis courts are 3D models. The tennis players are actors filmed in front of green screens. The buildings and props in the foreground are 3D models. They're, they're textured, lighting is put on them. Uh, additional actors are inserted. 
and then it is all rendered together, uh, composited together, as it were, and a virtual camera is, is, is moved through the scene like that, and you wind up with some of these fantastic establishing shots for environments, things like that in film, uh, that become completely believable because the way that the compositor is brought together. Uh, and these, you know, you would be surprised at how many shots that could exist in the real world like these are really being done in uh, effects studios, in CG studios, where compositors are weaving it all together uh, because it's a lot more affordable than having to find the real world location, get all the necessary permits and insurance and hire the personnel to go out and do the shoot in a very limited period of time. Instead, all of it can be put together and the director and the studio and the art directors have full creative control of what the final product is gonna look like. So if you're, if you're big picture, if you wanna put it all together, if you wanna make big sweeping scenes like this, do set extensions digitally for, for television shows and science fiction and whatnot, uh, really any genre, this could be an interesting uh, career path for you. The final example of a role in the pipeline that we wanna look at are previs artists. So we're gonna go from the very end of the pipeline all the way to the very beginning uh, uh, for film and cinematic sequences. These are artists that are big picture thinkers. They're, they're storytellers at heart. Um, so instead of working on just a small slice of uh, 3D animation for a film and just working on that one scene or just a few scenes for months and months and months on end, these are the artists that go in and essentially make a moving storyboard of the entire film. Um, and they get to work very closely with the director and the cinematographer to set up obviously simplified models and simplified animation, but they're getting the story across. And they get to do things like set up the shots and, and arrange the, you know, the, the camera and what lenses are used and how all that's going to take place because the visual information needs to be there for everybody else who's going to be working on that very complex film after that point. So if you're interested in working in 3D, 3D animation, but you also would love to work closely with a director, uh, think like a cinematographer and work with cinematographers and film, this could be an awesome career path for you. Okay, so let's talk briefly about Noman's academic offerings and how we are training artists for these roles. Uh, as you can see here, this is all of Noman's academic programs and courses. Uh, we are a very highly focused school, so you can see on the top row here, we have two full-time programs, a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. It's a full-time four-year program with a college degree in digital production. We also have something that is a two-year program called the Certificate Program. This one's more advanced. It's a little bit more akin to a master's degree level of study. Uh, both of these are full-time, uh, and uh, both of them require an application process, submitting an application portfolio, and I'll talk to you just, just a moment about how you can do that. Uh, but on the bottom row here, you'll see we have something called a foundation in art design, which is a course designed to help you build an application portfolio at Noman, as well as well over 70 classes that are part of our full-time programs, also available as individual courses. So taking a closer look at the Bachelor of Fine Arts degree program at Noman, as I mentioned, this is fully accredited, which means access to financial aid and those kinds of things are there. Um, and we have uh, people at Noman that can help you know where to go and look and research for that. Uh, this is going to be full time on the Noman campus. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, in both of the full time programs, you learn the entire pipeline. We call this a 3D generalist skill set. You learn how to do all the jobs, essentially. But then that becomes your platform to build areas of concentration and choosing electives for the, you know, kind of what is the area and aspect that you want to move into with your career. Uh, so we do have two optional concentrations in the Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. One is game art, which is going to take all of the different things you're learning for the pipeline and learn it specifically for use within game engines like Unreal Engine. Uh, but we also have a concentration in VFX, which opens up some of the previously uh, uh, VFX classes that were only available in the two-year program, bring some of those more advanced VFX classes as uh, being available in the Bachelor of Fine Arts degree for those that want to really focus on VFX for their career. Um, you're going to learn that entire pipeline. You're going to build extra skill sets on top of that foundation. And that really is the reason why, because of that comprehensive education, studios come to Noman. They're looking for Noman grads because they know that when they hire you, they may be hiring you as an animator or as a character artist or as an environment artist, but they're getting someone that understands the entire pipeline, that understands the rest of the studio and the environment and the process that they're working within 
also makes you really valuable as an employee because you're able to do more than just one thing if that's going to be needed. The uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts program is a four-year program, but in reality, it can be a three-year program if you choose not to uh, take summer breaks. If you stay on for each of the summer terms that you're in there, you finish the program within three years, which is what most Noman students choose to do. And it also has a rolling admission, which means it's not just about applying only in the fall and then you got to wait another year uh, if you're going to apply after that. We have application uh, processes set up and we admit students uh, into any of the four terms uh, that the that the school is going in the year. And it means that you can start in uh, the not just the fall, but the spring, uh, winter, summer, and so forth. Uh, as Alex mentioned, next week we're getting ready to start up a new term. So you could start into the beginning of a full-time program any of those four times out of the year. Um, so moving forward, we're going to take a quick look at our two-year certificate program. This is going to have the same type of education uh, you're still going to get that, uh, you know, foundational 3D skill sets and all that. You're going to get to choose an area of emphasized study, but it is done within just two years, which means it's going to be more intensive. It's going to be a higher level of study, um, and uh, it's really designed for people who already have experience with art. Maybe they have a degree from another art school, um, or you've been out there working and you want to uh, pivot a bit towards this, and you want to come to a place that you can enter a full-time program that within just two years of really intensive study, you can pivot into that area, learn what you need to learn to be able to graduate and go out there and start working in digital production. Uh, as I mentioned, you've got the same kind of broad skill set in 3D that you learn, and then you pick from one of uh, five different areas of emphasized study, whether that's going to be things like um, animation or modeling and texturing, whether that's visual effects and so forth. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, it's kind of like the Navy SEALs program. It's going to be super fast, hyper intensive. Uh, but if that's something you're interested in, you can definitely inquire about the two-year program at Noman. Uh, next up, I'll just mention, as I said earlier, the foundation in art design is there to help you build a portfolio. There's no portfolio submission or application process that is necessary. This is something you just talk with Noman admissions about enrolling in. But it is a course that lasts up to a year. Uh, it's not required that you stay in it for the whole year. It is designed for you to get in and get the classes that you're going to need to build the portfolio that you need. So these would be foundational skill sets like figure drawing, anatomy for artists, learning how to draw in perspective, uh, color and light theory, composition. And then you get into some really cool enter entertainment design classes like creature and character design, vehicles, mechs, props, environments, and so forth. Uh, so if you're looking to build a portfolio, if you uh, are thinking, you know, perhaps I don't have the skills yet that I need to apply to Noman. This is perfect for you. Um, and it all even is a great uh, course to go through if you need to build up a portfolio to apply to a different kind of art school as well. And as I mentioned, uh, well over 70 of our courses are available individually. Um, individual classes at Noman are a great option for, say, someone who is maybe you're currently in a junior college, but you want to kind of test the waters or get to get to learn some specific skills to find out what it's like to go to school at Noman before you transfer. You can grab an individual class. The majority of Noman classes are, in fact, taught um, in the evening time frame, as well as we have classes on the weekends and during the weekdays as well. Uh, but there are a lot of options available of on-campus individual classes that are going to be available outside of, you know, typical work hours or typical school hours. Um, so this is a fantastic way for you either to come back and train some extra areas. Maybe if you're out there working in studio and you want to learn more about virtual production, jump in, take one of those individual classes. Or maybe you are a college student that wants to prepare for Noman and you want to get a leg up and start taking some of these things. You could do that as well. So the last thing I want to cover here, uh, and aside from, you know, explaining the educational offerings, possibly one of the most important things I can tell you today. And the reason why it's so important is because uh, you use a word like admissions. <coughs> College admissions has immediately a certain uh, idea that comes with it. Typically, uh, at an art school, the admissions experiences, these are the people you wait to talk to until you've got your entire portfolio prepped all your I's dotted, all your T's crossed, and then you go to admissions and try to present yourself and impress them and make sure you get to school and then you wait for them to come back to tell you whether or not you got in. Um, what I wanna tell you is a Noman just doesn't work that way. Uh, we, we do it very, very different. And this is really important to understand because it's often very hard for people to grasp the idea that we want to coach you and work with you before you apply. Um, 
people apply to art schools and one of the most things they get nervous about is, well, what does the school want to see in my portfolio? I have no idea. I've got to go figure that out. We want to help you figure that out. Uh, so our admissions advisors at Noman, we've got an amazing team of people um, and they're all accomplished artists themselves. What they want to do is they want to they want to get to know you and see your artwork and begin to coach you and help you grow and develop as an artist and know that according to based on your skill sets and what you know how to do, how you can build the most effective application portfolio before you apply to the school. Um, I've known these advisors to work with some artists for upwards of a year, helping them prepare. Uh, so really, when you think about reaching out to admissions at Noman, it is not something that you want to wait to do. If you are thinking about Noman, if you're curious about Noman, whether or not you know that you want to apply, um, you are 100% qualified to reach out to admissions. Um, and uh, one of my colleagues just dropped a paper form link in the chat. If you'd like to speak with an advisor just for that, that initial conversation and, and starting to get coaching and input on your portfolio and your artwork, you can follow that paper form link. It's going to take you just a basic contact card, essentially. Uh, we're going to be needing to get some information from you so we can reach out to you. This is not information that we're going to use or sell later or something like that. It's just to help us get in touch with you. Fill out the card. What's going to happen next is, you know, within a couple of days, you're going to get an email from admissions. Uh, so do keep an eye on your email. Um, people sometimes use email less and less these days, but that's where you're going to want to look for that contact to come through. And also, you know, be sure to take a peek from time to time in your spam folder just in case that email gets routed there. Uh, but you're going to hear from admissions first that way by answering that email um, that will get that conversation going that can ultimately lead to perhaps a, you know, a Zoom appointment or something like that. But they're going to ask to start seeing your artwork. You do not have to have a complete and finished portfolio to show your artwork to these guys. They want to see anything you're making because they're going to look for your strengths the way that you can best present yourself to Noman. And then they're also going to look for the areas that that you can grow. And they're going to offer um, some suggestions and some assignments and some feedback that's going to help you uh, grow in those areas and build the most well-rounded portfolios possible. Aside from that really important coaching, of course, they're available to answer questions, talk about financial aid, talk about housing, you name it, they're here to help you. So if you're interested, please do reach out. Um, so with that, I just want to say, you know, campus, is opening up again for the next term. It's been open for the last term. It's been great to be back on campus again. If you need more information about campus, you can certainly call the school. You can reach out to admissions. If you fill out that form and you get an email, um, you can raise you know, campus-oriented questions or tour questions to admissions. Um, we are, you know, despite, because of uh, current COVID regulations, we can only offer very limited tours of campus. But if you are interested in that, um, we'll be starting up uh, some tours again at the top of uh, February. Uh, limited options and smaller tour sizes, but uh, there are some great uh, links that you can go to that can be made, made available, available to you through admissions and even on the website if you want to come tour the campus. Um, and uh, that's essentially it for the stream, guys. I would invite you to keep coming back to the channel. We are constantly doing some really amazing events, educational streams. We've, we're starting up some really cool stream content, ranging from Creature Corner with uh, Creature... Um, concept artist Jared Krzyzewski, where he is jamming out in ZBrush, working on some cool creatures, answering questions. It's really just an awesome art hang with an accomplished industry artist to help you out uh, and have some great conversation. Uh, in the same vein, we have uh, something called uh, Archetype with Josh Herman, who is, you know, he's an artist that's worked with Marvel, Naughty Dog, uh, Legacy Effects. He's, he uh, helped design uh, Groot. He's worked on some of the Iron Man armor and the Marvel films and, and so on and so forth. So these are really amazing artists. These guys are streaming weekly. Uh, definitely take a look at our events and streaming content to be able to find out when those streams are happening. Uh, and then beyond that, more informational streams like the one I'm doing right now, as well as some really awesome industry events with studios and projects uh, that we all love. So please do come back, follow us on social media to find out when those streams are happening. Um, but with that, guys, I just want to say thanks for tuning in. Uh, thanks for hanging uh, with Alex uh, and myself. And uh, for those of you who stuck around for the informational session, it's been great to be able to resource you in that regard. Um, but for today, uh, this is Adam Hartzell signing off, saying uh, stay safe, everybody. Stay creative. Um, and I would love to see you on the Noman campus sometime in the future. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.